delighted to be joined on the show today by the writer and director of the upcoming Discovery Screening Fright Fest entry A Hostile Dimensions, Graham Hughes. Hi Graham, how are you doing? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. I got there, it's part four of an oh. atten- attempt at an intro, but we got there, I'm, as I said, I'm <laughs> as professional as you would expect. Um, thanks very much. For- is, that's, that's, a, that's a good innings. Aye, yeah, well, we can talk about takes and things like that once we get into the film detail. <laughs> um, I, I don't think mine went very well, but anyway. Um, so I thanks for coming on. Uh, obviously, it's been a, a while since I've spoke to you over Zoom or Zencast or anything like that. How's things been with yourself? Things are good, yeah, yeah. Just uh, working away, working all hours of the day. Yeah, aye, the usual things. Um we will come on to talk about, obviously, your new movie, Hostile Dimensions. Um, what I want to do, though, is kind of start from post-Death of a Vlogger, your previous uh, your previous movie. Um, once you had wrapped, and obviously got a great reception, great feedback, great reviews, and um, I think the first time I became aware of it was over on Evolution of Horror. Once that all kind of died down a bit, did you have a plan to get right back into writing or even filming straight away obviously we had the pandemic hit and things like that but what was your kind of thoughts once that all sort of calmed down a wee bit um well the first thing was um coming out of the festivals and that was just trying to find a a sales agent or or get buyers for the film and uh Mm. once i did that then it was waiting to see how much money it brought in and um, whether I could leverage those into other films or whether I was going to be seeking finance from independent people. Um, so still like, even now, I'm still quite fresh at the the business of films. So just try to see what would happen actually making a film that found an audience and, you know, um, see what that lived up to. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, then like <laughs> 2020 happened. And it, <laughs> it just kind of stopped everything. So, um, so I like I had quite a like I'm very lucky that I had quite a nice lockdown. Um, I've got a nice home situation. I was able to work from home, and then it gave mm-hmm. me some space to just write for, um, without you know any pressure of having to make anything. So, um, yeah. So I but up until making Hostile Dimensions, I was I was just writing, just keeping my head down and writing. Yeah. Do you have a, a specific writing process or are you just kind of off the cuff or how do you go? Uh, usually I'm, I'm more of a plot person. Um, I like high right. concept ideas. Um, and a lot of the, certainly the films I've made, like are made from a kind of pragmatic sense of sense of things. So I'll yeah make sure that whatever I'm writing, I can make. Um, okay. Yep. And usually, if there's an idea, I, I tend to get really excited about an idea, and then I'll know within about a day whether it's any good or not. Um, sometimes, like within Aye. a day, it's just like, oh, what was like? No, that why? Why did I think that was good? That shite. And then, <laughs> and then other ideas just sort of live on, and um, they'll basically just percolate away for weeks or months or even years until they kind of reach a saturation point, and then I can like actually start writing. Um, yeah. And I tend to, I've got a day job, so I tend to uh, write in the pub. That's that's kind of like how I get through. Because um, especially, uh, you know, in the kind of looser lockdowns when I was still full, full-time full working at home to do a full shift at this yeah. desk and then have dinner and come back and start writing again could feel a bit grim sometimes. So to like mm. just take the laptop and the dog to the pub um, just made it, nice. and gave it like a bit of fun in that, especially when it's all... Um, speculative and not getting paid up front for any of the, the writing work that I do it needs to have that element of fun. I need to get an enjoyment out of it. So that's yeah. that's my process to uh, get drunk <laughs> basically. So it's a, a good one. I mean obviously the first time we had a face to face meeting was in a pub. So you kinda stayed consistent with that, Sloan's in Glasgow. Yeah. Um that was a, a very messy night. My workmate never turned up for work the next day. Yeah. Uh, I did. I braved it out. I was very rough. Um, that that was like as well that was one of the first kinda lockdown breaks. Like I think I was after mm-hmm. the, the first kind of long lockdown. And, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, and I think the yeah. three of us were just like absolutely like ready for it. And I remember even yeah. like, we got like I don't know if we left the pub or got chucked out or 
we were looking for another one. It was like nowhere was open, nowhere would take us because it was all everyone yeah. was like so cagey and it's like you hadn't booked a aye. table and aye. yeah, uh, it was it was interesting and uh, it was probably better that way because it was five o'clock in the morning. I had to get up at so, but yeah, that was uh, that was, uh, that's another story. Um, so yeah, as you're saying, like you get the the kind of time at the pub. Does did they having as you said having that ability and that eh, I say ability that time to write without the pressure on you? Do you think that added to your writing? Did you have lots of ideas before? Obviously, again, we'll come on to hostile dimensions that you actually thought maybe that you would push forward with. Uh, yeah, so the two scripts that I came out of lockdown with, n- neither of them were hostile dimensions. Um, okay, one of them uh, is a film that I've been trying to get off the ground. Yeah, now for about three years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got some finance for it. We're looking to basically complete the finance for that now. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, that'll be like a nice kind of step up for me. It's like a contained, um, basically really straightforward, scary kind of single person, single location film. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wrote that first. And then the second script that I wrote, the, the freedom when that came with like having one in the bag that, that was sort of like doable so the second uh-huh. script that i wrote was more like just letting my imagination run and try to be less pragmatic with like well how would i do this like who would i know that i could make this with and it was just more well what film would i want to see and yeah. being able to like just knowing that it'll almost certainly never get made but it's been written so <laughs> just like yeah. finding the joy of writing again Mm. And you said obviously Hostile Dimensions wasn't one that came out of lockdown. Was that quite a a quick writing process for you? Obviously, conceptually wise, it's quite out there and weird and um, trippy to an extent. <laughs> was that a, was it a, an, an easy write for you once you started kind of getting into the meat of it? I don't. I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was definitely quick. Um, mm-hmm. So it was kind of like. But March twenty twenty two, March last year, and um, I was speaking to uh, sales agents that I've been working with on uh, Caesar. If an executor is the kind of contained film that I'm hoping to make next, so okay. the sales agents for Hostile Dimensions are also uh, sales agents for Executor, and um, film moves so slowly, like so ridiculously slowly, <laughs> um, and I get uh, really impatient. It was like March last right. year. I could see, I could see sort of the roadmap laid out ahead, and it was going to be like right. probably about like best case scenario, maybe a year we would get the financing together. And I was sitting there, I was like, I could make another film in that time. <laughs> I could put something <laughs> together, like with the money that I right. got from uh, Death of a Vlogger, I can like self finance yeah. it and then um, uh, just do like a quickie and then. Um, spoke to the the guys at the sales agency and they were keen um i think i ended up i think i shot myself in the foot a little bit with that i think it pushed back executor but um Mm -hmm. but i've got like another film out of it that i'm really proud of but uh yeah between basically between march last year and um and like it's kind of like a it's a moving timeline of when the film was finished like you could argue it's not actually finished yet i'm still working on deliverables and stuff but we had a cast and crew okay. screening in, in like may i think this year so it was yes. it was about 14 months from concept to screening right quite a turnaround and um talking about the the filming the uh, hostile dimensions i was going to ask about locations so obviously we're not getting to plot or anything yet was the locations in Far East? Like, was there like it looked like it was? I don't know if that was maybe you were on holiday, maybe had a chance. Yeah, it was exactly that, but it wasn't. It was <laughs> the exact, it was the exact other direction. Uh, right. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, it's not really spoilery to say. Um, hmm. Me and my spouse Joma, who also stars in the film, um, hmm. we were at a friend's wedding in New York last October. And that was around about the time that we were filming, and uh, right. uh, and the scene you're talking about was just shot on like a, a GoPro that I own. Um, right. So I was like, "Fuck it, right? I'm in the scene. We just need a camera 
and a person operating it. Uh. So, like, we just found an afternoon. We spent about half an hour just running around Chinatown in New York just to get <laughs> to get that scene. Nice. Um, because right. it's only like one shot. Uh, I think we did like two yeah. or three takes. I'm like, fine, done. If it works, it works. Right. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, no, right. but I just adding production value since we were there anyway. Hmm. And I've kind of done this a wee bit backwards, but for anyone who doesn't know or hasn't read the synopsis that might be uh, going to Fright Fest to see it, what is the story of Hostile Dimension? Um, so Hostile Dimensions is a <laughs> found footage sci-fi horror film uh, about two documentary filmmakers investigating the disappearance of a graffiti artist who seems to have gone missing through this freestanding door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's the as good a synopsis you can give without giving too much away, um, <laughs> because there is lots of kind of twists and turns and interesting imagery and uh, good scares as well. But one of the things I was I kind of maybe should have asked a wee bit earlier was the the found footage the way you wanted to go again after vlogger. Did you think that because obviously you're saying that. You had that time in between uh, Executor coming out. Was that something that just kind of it worked well the last time? I've got an idea that can work as a concept anyway in found footage. Yeah, it was a bit. It's a bit of both. It was a bit maybe cart before the horse. And uh, hmm. when I when I wrote the film, I've got two really close film friends who are brilliant writers as well, and hmm. the three of us all share our work and help each other with redrafts and that. And uh, yeah. We did a read through, and one of the first questions from uh, my friend Sean, he was like, "Does it need to be found footage though? Like, shouldn't you just make this as a kind of standard fiction style film?" And I see his point, but if I were to make it in that way, it wouldn't exist. That we wouldn't have made the film. Basically, the uh, the logistic value that. Uh, found footage ads um it just helps with all kinds of logistics and budget um mm-hmm. and uh ultimately in my heart as well like i just i love found footage as well so it's like i, I think it's way scarier than uh, most other horror and it's just like more visceral mm-hmm. and immediate um yeah so uh, it was nice being able to kind of jump back into that zone uh, and for me anyway again uh, a message after I watched it you've got two for two in the film footage I absolutely loved it I thought it was great thanks so um, much man thank you no nah, not a problem um, thank you for giving me a chance to see it early <laughs> those are put me in contact with the right people who did knock me back <laughs> so it was, it was quite handy um, you obviously had the movie at Cannes this year as well what was that experience like uh, so just a caveat that <laughs> right, uh, <okay. laughs> it was uh, yeah we we presented it at, um, at the market um, right, right. market event so just in case I'm just always wary of like <laughs> no. seeming like a masquerade like ah we played it can yeah <laughs> but, no, Dang, sorry, um, no 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 not at all no apologies you needed just more just making sure that it doesn't sound like you know. Uh, we weren't playing next to fucking uh, zone of interest and sh- <laughs> um, but uh, no, it was still it was a massive privilege, and I can't believe like it, it was, um, yeah, a real real learning experience. I felt extremely privileged to be able to go there and present the film to. Mm. It was an event for financiers, buyers, sales agents, and festivals essentially. Um, yeah. So uh, I just got to go up on stage and kind of show a wee reel and talk about the film and try and get people excited about it nice. and it was great it was my first time in Cannes, like festival or otherwise in a yeah beautiful town totally mental <laughs> a mental world like <laughs> like with the the festival and the market going on there it's mm. just so surreal it's just absolutely fucking yeah. surreal right and was that where you got a uh, blue finch distributing over here isn't it yeah they're so where, um, um they're doing sales up? for for a start um the sales right okay yeah uh they may distribute but um i tbd i guess okay right Fair enough um but uh, yeah so... we met, met them uh, a couple of years ago so that was the it was 
through them actually really that um managed to get to can with with the oh, film. Okay. Um, right, interesting. In a big part. Yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah, they've been really supportive and um I got a lot of nice things to say about them. Good stuff. Um you you mentioned the cast, obviously it's all of the cast you work with on Death of Vlogger, but Joma, uh, Annabelle, uh, Stephen coming back as well. Um Obviously, Joma being your partner, do you use, do you enjoy working together? Obviously, being working together can be a bit different from obviously a married now as well. Married life, it's a bit uh, a, a different aspect, a different way to look at things. Yeah, um, I I enjoy working with them, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> like they have like a, a they really want to be a actor. But I think they hate filmmaking. <laughs> so right. It's like a, it's a weird kind of, right. um, yeah, push and pull in that one. But mm. uh, no, it's great because like Joma's a, um, a writer as well. Um, they're an mm-hmm. author and it's brilliant just being able to have conversations about story and dialogue and structure and all these things and know that like... Um, they're better versed than I am in, in that sort of thing. Like their writing mm-hmm. is amazing. So it's a real nice kind of uh, relationship, like in, in many ways, but um, yeah. like particularly in that way. Mm-hmm. And again, filmed in or certain aspects, filmed in your, your own flat again. And it's just that kind of, obviously it's not guerrilla filmmaking, but the, I think uh, someone who, I've kind of been on a few podcasts with uh, Kat said that it's like the kind of back to basic style of filmmaking and you work, work really well with your surroundings and you make the most of it and again it's something that I definitely felt in Hostile Dimensions you've got some great practical elements to it one thing that I thought was interesting in this one is there was a bit, a bit more CGI Um which um again I'm not going to get into too many too much detail, <laughs> um because I don't want to give it away. But it was that was and it worked really well. It worked great. Was that a, again a conscious choice to try and add these extra elements to the the kind of background of the movie and the meat of the movie again? Yeah, definitely. And like in in tandem with the fact that you know we did shoot in the same flat again. Uh, no. In a lot of ways, because I'm so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> like, just everyone come here and we'll make a film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, like, it's I think um, because everything's on such a razor margin and uh, try to make gold out of, out of nothing. Um, mm. Having things like being able to shoot in my flat, like a really known location, the kitchen's there. Everyone can be catered really easily. Like, as soon as you're out in location, it's like. It's just arms and legs, or even someone else's flat. Um, then it's it just adds logistical difficulties that on a production like this um, just are not welcome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. um, so I knowing that I was going to shoot in here again uh, added to the the pressure, I suppose, that I wanted to like make it bigger and different. Um, Aye. like I didn't want like while it was a a pragmatic decision, I didn't want it to to look like a a cheap decision. Um, no. so I like we we redecorated the place for a start, um, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, using the 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 mechanism of the door as like a a way to show other worlds and um making those worlds like I, I guess there's like a it also comes down to kind of like two. I think there's there's a lot of ways to cut like the fine footage genre, but I think there's like two main divisions, um, uh-huh. and that is the ones that make you are trying to make you buy into the reality of it, and the ones that mm-hmm. are just using it as a a formal device. Um, mm-hmm. So like Blair Witch is like trying to fool you, Paranormal Activity is trying to fool you, um, yeah. Savage Land things like that, and then you got like Chronicle and um, grave encounters and a yeah. wreck, even where it's like, well, you know, th- obviously it's not real, so it's not as though like you're not buying into it. So I think that's yeah. kind of a distinction. I don't think anyone for a second bought into death of. Well, actually, that's not true. Some people did 
message Annabelle asking <laughs> really? if I was okay. Um, really? But it definitely fits more into the former of like trying to be a bit more believable. Mm-hmm. And this one, it's just like, no, this, this is not real. This is like, uh, <laughs> there's like, yeah, CGI shit <laughs> floating about in alien worlds. Yeah. Like, no one is ever going to be fooled by this. So that, that was kind of yeah. part of that. Aye. Using the mechanism just for storytelling instead of exactly, believability yeah. type of thing. Aye. Yeah, storytelling. I just noticed this. Oh, sorry. I've, no- I've noticed in the background is that fox mask oh, yeah. from the movie. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so obviously, yeah, it's, there's there's lots of different worlds that you're portrayed, and one thing I thought about it as well, and then there was a lot of good kind of comedy moments or funny moments in Death of a Vlogger. But it certainly seemed like you leaned a bit more into it in this one, in Hostile Dimensions, because there's a level of absurdity to it as well, but it's maybe not in vlogging as much. Um, two, two certain parts got really big laughs out of me, especially the, the Fox thing. I just I was thinking, going, that's just fucking mad. Like, <laughs> using the best way to describe it. And again, is it a conscious effort? Is it something that you, going into a, a, a multiverse world as it is, as, as, the kind of film progresses, having that kind of scope to have everything so strange and weird and funny was, again, something that was important to kind of develop as it went on. Yeah, I think um, because it's so ridiculous mm. um, that I think you, <laughs> I think you would in that situation just be like, making jokes i think once once the shock of the the reality the situations like kind of worn off you would be mm-hmm. like i there was a fucking weird panda with tentacles and so you'd be like yeah that, that, what, what the fuck was that like you, you wouldn't just be yeah. i don't think you'd be that traumatized by it after the fact um and, and i think uh i don't know if you you uh identify with us as well but i think there's a scottish thing to just really downplay the bombastic and like <laughs> not be kind of fa- lot of like things like phase you like that and just kind of make fun yeah. of if anything's too serious like you just like, play it off exactly play it off yeah and uh yeah i wanted to kind of have that vibe through it that like mm-hmm. obviously the film gets serious in parts it's not like the robots yeah. are like unemotional at all um but there is that there's always that urge to just sort of downplay things and make a joke uh-huh. out of stuff yeah Definitely. Yeah, when there's a, a, a giant panda with tentacles and a soft play. Uh it's it's very it is very run back through the door and go, What the fuck was that? Yeah. And then just gonna carry on. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it's um it works really well for it. Again, yeah, that's um as I said, it's not it, there as you mentioned, there is serious parts in it and uh, there is scary parts. There's really unnerving settings. Um again, it's really difficult to try not to go into too much spoilers, <laughs> but kind of the 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 last act of the movie is probably where it ramps up the tension, ramps up the scares, certainly to a point. Um and a really effective again. Um so yeah, as I said, coming from Death of a Vlogger, a bit more jump scare heavy, which I absolutely love. Big fan of jump scares. Whereas in Hostile Dimensions, you've got an ending and a kind of third act that is a sort of constant tension. There's no relief, really, for the viewer because you're always expecting something to happen, something to go wrong as the the kind of climax is approaching. Was that, a, again, a conscious decision moving away from a more sort of jump scare heavy finale as it was in Vlogger? Yeah, it was, I'm the same as you. I love jump scares, like obviously. Mm. Like, <laughs> um, right. I, lo- I love. Uh, I, I think similar to found footage, actually, they've been cheapened by people making them cheap. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like um, they're not inherently bad. It's just how you mm. how you use them. Um, and uh, yeah, I, th- I did. I think that's part of why there's not that many in hostile dimensions is because i don't want to just crowbar them in i think they need to be earned and i think they need to be executed in a way that the audience isn't going to feel cheated and um yeah. and yeah the ending of hostile dimensions just didn't really lend itself to it as much mm-hmm. it's funny there's one uh there's one scene in the film that in hostile dimensions that i uh every time i see it i'm like ah that's 
it's like the death of a vlogger scene i don't know if you like picked up on it as well it's just like there's one scene where they literally like grab a camera and walk through the, like the length of the house towards the bedroom and i was like that's that could have just been like lifted straight out of death of a vlogger i'm kind of annoyed yeah. annoyed at myself for like retreading <laughs> that material but uh but i is that just try to like uh keep them a piece i guess but um mm. also make them their own things i'm worried yeah. that uh as well that people are gonna like come from death of a vlogger into this expecting it to be super scary and i don't think it's they're not really similar in that mm. sense you know yeah i think with vlogger it certainly it was an outright horror this leans more into the kind of fantastical the sci-fi element of it um i know the bunny i'm talking about and but i think again it was earned as well so it works um it's a, a great build up to just that scene um again not, not spoiling it, but there's a couple <laughs> i don't think there was there's a couple that were really effective and again they worked very well they worked well within the kind of surreal surreal surreality of <laughs> the the movie it's an easy one for me to say um yeah, it, and with it being the sci-fi thing, is sci-fi a big influence for yourself as well as the horrors? You're not a, a much a sci-fi fan. I I love basically all cinema. There's yep. there's very few. I don't know if there's any genres I've completely written off. Uh, I don't think there is any. Give anything a yeah. chance. Um, yeah. But yeah, I love I love sci-fi. Uh, yeah, like um, so it was my, it was my birthday at the weekend and. Uh, I picked Nothing. like yeah, thank you. I picked like three films for me and Joma to watch. It was they're all rewatches, and I was like, let's just let's just watch all bangers all day. Um, and thinking on it now, they were all <laughs> they're all sci-fi. So it was a uh, Looper, hey. Nope, and Fury Road. Um, nice. so it's like yeah, I guess you know, like I I just uh, I, I've never really thought too hard about like favorite genres beyond horror but yeah I, mm. I think i love sci-fi as well <laughs> yeah. i love them all and was there anything that you in particular that you watched whether during the writing process or during the filming process that kind of got the, the juices flowing for hostile dimensions uh, not massively i wanted to watch no. um i wanted to watch everything everywhere all at once and something in the dirt those were the two that i thought would be the most uh, not, maybe not similar, but I wanted to kind of like get inspiration or at least avoid uh, similar territory. Um, yeah. But n- neither of them came out until like about a month after we'd shot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't get to like uh, right. see other. No, no, like I think because the, the shooting time was so short. Uh, sorry, the, the writing time was so short as well that uh, mm-hmm. didn't do a whole lot of kind of homework on viewing. For it, so yeah, um, I think yeah. it maybe was something so kind of out there and balls to the wall, maybe avoiding those not similar movies because they are each kind of of their own. You don't want to have that in the back of your head as well, yeah, because yeah. it might kind of stunt your creativity for it or yeah. you second guess yourself, maybe, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, it's, it's a like double edged sword because like yeah if you do watch them then you can at least avoid things that are say you have like the exact same shot or scene or uh, that line of dialogue or something you can at least avoid that so you know um yeah because like people read into uh yeah just people read into what they watch because you know the only person that knows fully what goes into it is the people that make it like um, yeah. Like with the uh, with death of a vlogger, I, I mind watching Lake Mungo. So I, I shot death of a vlogger, death of a vlogger in a weird way, um, where I shot it over like about six months. Okay. Um. So it was literally just like I was writing it and shooting it at the same time, and I would come home from work, just come here, and I would shoot a scene, um, right. and then whack it into the edit, and then shoot another scene, like just kind of weekends and evenings over six months. And it was about three mm-hmm. months in when the it was really taking shape, and I was like, right, I, I see the end, and now it's all like. It's gonna get finished, and it was about three months in, and I watched Lake Mungo. I was a fuck's sake! <laughs> like, <laughs> I think, I think, like, I got halfway through Lake Mungo, and I was shitting myself. Well, for multiple reasons. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, I genuinely, like, halfway through, I was like, I'm going to have to fucking put Death of a Logger in the bin. It's too similar in terms of, like, I've made I've made the fucking Wish version of, uh, of Lake Mungo. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got, like, finished it, and I was like, all right, they're different enough. It's fine. Um, right. But yeah, constantly, like, people compare the two and never favorably because <laughs> <laughs> like monk is so good no that's yeah. not fair in yourself you're the cracker oh, thanks man but yeah sorry i'm not trying to fish for compliments but uh <laughs> no, no, just, no, just no, that no. way when it's like sometimes sometimes it's better if you think you're going to tread similar ground to maybe just watch it first and make sure you're <laughs> not that, completely that that's where it works it does work both ways yeah, yeah. um with the uh Obviously, you've got your the kind of UK premiere at Fright Fest, the Discovery screeners, as I eventually managed to get out. <laughs> uh, I think it's shown the Saturday about three o'clock, the Monday about one. I think you'll be there for the Saturday. You'll be before. there for the Saturday. Yeah. Uh, is obviously you've had the, the experience with Fright Fest before. Are you looking forward to having that again? And do you go to Fright Fest often? Have you been other, apart from Pierre? I've Oster? been. Twice, so once with okay. Death of a Blogger, and then once after that, <laughs> like I don't know, Some everything's a blur. But yeah, yeah. So this will be my third time, um, and I yeah, absolutely chuffed that they've asked us back. Like nothing's ever mm. guaranteed like that. So it's just, uh, it's just really, it's nice that they've kind of stuck by me and um, yeah, helping me get my work out there. So yeah, I'm really grateful to to the whole team. Yeah, and yeah, it's always been a, a kind of champion of indie filmmakers isn't it? Fright Fest, and it's probably its its strongest point. I think like there is bigger movies that show there. There is studio, yeah. not maybe not necessarily studio. Well, there is studio pictures that show there, but I think it's uh, it's voice for putting out indie horror certainly one of its strong points. Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard that the this year's lineup is particularly good. Um, I've not I've, actually seen a huge amount of it. No, no, I've yeah, barely yeah. seen. I don't yeah. even know if I've seen like anything beyond that film that's there. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, just from people doing those vague kind of tweets, like you know, watching the fright, this fright fest film and it's going to blow you away. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a few of them. Yeah, aye, aye. I mean, that's really early screeners they're getting as well. Like, <laughs> like is it two weeks? I suppose. I suppose they're looking for the reviews and everything to come out. But um, so. One thing I was going to ask, and again, I'm not going to spoil, and I keep saying that, but I'm just trying to <laughs> get it in my head not to spoil anything. Obviously, with Death of a Vlogger, there was an ambiguous ending. Or certainly if some people maybe read it as unambiguous and that uh, that you died at the end of it. But um, with Hostile <laughs> Dimensions, there is a cliffhanger style ending. As a sequel to either of those two movies something that you would be interested in doing or do you just like having it kind of hanging like obviously you've got executor coming out next so it would be further in the future but are sequels something you're interested in like maybe expanding the lore of either of the two movies you've got uh yeah sequels are definitely something i'm into um mm. for these films i I'd, I'd toyed with death of a vlogger for a bit i thought it'd be fun to do a kind of a uh, like grave encounters style or like Blair Witch style, um, like meta sequel, you know, really? like where uh-huh. I actually do play myself this time. And, right. Interesting. You know, something along those lines, but it's fucking daft. And not, like, it was just more like, <laughs> wouldn't that be funny? That'd be fu- oh well. Anyway, what's next? <laughs> and uh, and uh-huh. Hostile Dimensions, like, I think it has crossed my mind, but uh, the world. In which, like, the way that that world is left, I don't know if documentaries are going to be anyone's priority. <laughs> like, to, to, to not that's very fucking fair. spoil the film, but uh, no, no, no. I mean that could be interesting. It would be. It probably. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I think short answer. Nah, not not for <laughs> yeah. these. But uh, I, <laughs> I love see like yeah. Some of my favorite films are sequels, so mm. I would love at some yeah. point to be able to. Kind of make a a series. Be cool. Yeah, 
Plus, you have to go bigger as well, and then you need yeah. to get the bigger CGI. <laughs> and I mean, there's already some flying stuff, and you know, yeah. <laughs> just sitting, sweating, having to do all the overtime. Yeah. That'd be the thing. You'd have to do what? What I have <laughs> been seriously considering is uh, making a third found footage film uh, okay. based out of this flat. Um, nice. So yeah, I've got I've got a solid idea for that one. And uh, basically, just going to sort of see how the next, um, see how this film goes down, see what the future mm-hmm. looks like, and uh, yeah, follow the money in a sense, I guess, but, yeah. <laughs> um, if there is any. Uh, uh-huh. But um, I that's that's something I'd be super keen to do. Mm. Um, but, I'll get the um, I'll get the the draft written up for when I send over asking for a screener again for whenever that comes out. <laughs> and I've already, in fact, I've written down my notes for executor as well for whenever. <laughs> we'll to see that. I was just, I speak to you enough. I can just drop in a casual yeah, yeah. release. How are you doing? And how's the movie? Where's my screener? That's, yeah. that's what I do. Um, well, I'll let you go. Obviously, before we kind of sign off, as you said, you've got Hostile Dimensions showing the Saturday, Monday at Fright Fest this year. Um, Executor is in the pipeline. Have, have you started the filming on Executor yet? No, no, we're uh, no. still looking for looking for finance. Looking for the finance. So, uh, mm-hmm. If okay. anyone rich is watching this, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I have no, I have no money, man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, unless like for some reason I got sent two of these at the one time. So if these are worth money, I can try sell one of them. John Lennon. I don't know. John don't Lennon, Funko Pop. Aye, exactly. And I've got two. I've actually got three. They sent me it three times for some reason. So maybe <laughs> two of them. That could work as something. Because you're making uh, an, um, an all, all John Beatles lineup. Just need one more. I put them on a stage and then someone will buy that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's how we've got. We've got I've got my plan to make my millions. Just selling the same John Lennon Funko. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a poor business plan. The uh, So yeah, as I said, so... Fright Fest at the end of this month. Um, and aside from that, where can everyone find Death of Logger? Where can they find yourself? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think Amazon? Death of Logger was on Freevee. Yeah, it was on Freevee. It was, it's on, I think uh, it's on Tubi. Uh, I think check I would, out Just Watch. That will tell you. It's, where it's somewhere. It. it exists yeah. out in the world somewhere. <laughs> Uh, or pirate Prime it, it. Like, uh, I'm not making much from royalties anyway so just pirate it it's fine <laughs> uh, and then I, I am um, at Faction Man on Twitter that's basically the only social media I use for my sins excellent um, Graham thanks again for, for joining us today thanks for your time and everyone check out Hostile Dimensions when you're at Fright Fest and hopefully we get a, get a wider distribution for it in the future Cheers. thanks Andy thanks for having me